minute. I'm getting flamed all over the place now just for saying, you know, this is not, this definitely not my future, but I am deeply grateful to you. Only in Iowa. Thank you very much. I would love to have been here for the caucuses, I'll tell you that. I was so envious of you all out here having that good a time. <laughs> And you were all over the place. It was such fun. And I was kind of mad, to tell you the truth, because I was editor of the Register for almost seven years. There was a caucus right before I became editor and a caucus right after. And the caucus in the middle, Tom Harkin ran, and we didn't have much of a caucus at all. So that was no fun. But thank you. <laughs> Who else? Yes. Well, I, I make a point of not criticizing this newspaper that I left, but, but partly because I don't know a, a thing about it. But this one I do know because a whole lot of people in Des Moines were unhappy and wrote me about it. The Des Moines Register actually made a decision to, and somebody in the audience can correct me about the details, but make at least part of the obit, if not all of the obit, essentially a paid it's a paid advertisement. Adver so, of course, you can write anything you want in an advertisement, and people would rather not talk about death. It is an obituary, but people would rather not talk about the cause of death. So they really want it to be a tribute, which has a place in the newspaper. We've always had advertising tributes, and believe me, I think it's a great, of course, it's a great idea for the newspaper. The newspaper loves advertising, but it's a great idea from a hum human standpoint. But when that takes the place of the obituary, you are being robbed of a whole lot of public information. And I just think it's a terrible shame. But I'll tell you, it's a great money earner. And so are weddings. And here's a dumb thing. Wedding. The, do you read the New York Times? Those wedding stories? I mean, do you love them or what? Let's admit it. They are brilliant. And yes, they take a lot of news hold. But I'm betting a lot of us go read them. And yet, across America, newspapers have turned their wedding announcements into advertisements, too. And let's admit, a journalist may not have a lot of gifts, but usually they can write. It's more fun to read, you know, something that is actually, it's just a shame. We're losing a lot of these sort of community building things by turning them over to the advertising department. And it makes, it's just great, you know, in terms of revenue, but it sure as hell makes for a less interesting and I would argue less informative newspaper. It's a shame. And the register is far from alone. It's happening all across the country. Yes. So what is the future for the newspaper? Because it sounds like basically the same as the weekly advertiser. Well, it's not, of course. It's not. But one thing is, I think you ought to clamor. I mean, it makes a difference if you complain. I wish everyone who gets a newspaper that does these things, of course, part of the problem is, again, this is really not fair, but I did happen to read the Register's announcement about doing this. And this is true of, all, again, all across the country. We do something like we reduce the size of the sheet. So we're giving you, actually, a smaller newspaper. And what do we tell you? We say, very handy to read while commuting. A much handier size. We don't say we dropped six million to the bottom line this year. That's what the Boston Globe dropped to the bottom line the year it went to a smaller web. Now, that may be fine, except that's less news hole. I mean, that's less content coming to you. And um, in the case of the Register and these obituaries, it was presented as a, you know, we are finally going to accede to the request. And this is true. This is definitely true. Over the years, I probably had more unhappy people calling me about obituaries than almost anything else. And these are people who are grieving. It's almost, you know, it's, it, there are some comparabilities to the rape victims question. You, you really would, when you're grieving, you want to say exactly what you want to say about the loved one. And sometimes obituaries go amiss. I'll never forget. Do you remember the Washington Post was sued by Tavalorius or whatever his name was? It was a big lawsuit. And... Okay, so this guy who did lots else in his life beside have this big libel suit of the Washington Post, when he died, the obituary, a third of it was about this lawsuit. I mean, I'm not saying we always do it right, but um, so back to your point. I'm sorry, I'm diverging. I really think that talking about it and saying, I really want, you know, I really want this, and, or at least noticing when these things happen. 
but also acknowledging that even though it isn't giving you uh, everything you want, it sure is better than the advertiser. And there are differences among media. And support the ones that are giving you what you want. I think we're moving into different, you know, different combinations of thing, things. I mean, in, in Europe, newspapers are paid for much more heavily by subscribers. Here, you pay probably 17, 18 percent, you subscribers to the register, you circulation pay, I mean, street sales and subscribers pay, may, may even be that high. So, you know, people call and say, I'm paying for this. Well, you know, actually, the car dealer is paying for it. <laughs> and that's another thing you need to worry about. Will they, I mean, when we were, you know, when I was editor of the Register, I remember a car dealer in Des Moines who was hauled before the Iowa Human Rights, uh, what was it called, Iowa Human Rights Commission? Terrible racial slurs, just appalling. And we ran the story, and he canceled, you know, million, two million, and I don't know whether they do that today. Not many newspapers do it. And, you know, usually they come back. But these are tough calls. And uh, if you hear about things, be sure and write. Be sure and call. Tell other people to write and call. And vote with your dollars and with your feet for the media that are serving you well. And teach these great young journalists not to stand for this stuff when it happens <laughs> at these news media they're going to join. Seriously, you got to raise questions. Of course, you got to keep your job. Of course, you got to get your job. Yes. <laughs> Boy, I'd love to know what you all think. You know, this, like the Red Eye in Chicago, the Washington Post Express, what these papers are doing is publishing a very small tab, very thin, and handing it out free to commuters, essentially. And it's really aimed at young people. Now, I'm all for, any, I'm all for anything that brings people into newspapers, because I believe in newspapers. Newspapers really are our best reporting medium. I know I'm prejudiced, but... I'm really telling the truth here. <laughs> anyway, so I'm all for bringing young people into the newspaper, but I can't help wondering if that really does that. I mean, I think people go, oh, here's this free thing, good, I'll do the crossword puzzle on the Metro, but does that really mean that then they say, oh, it turns out I really should, you know, pay, I should pay. Of course, the post is only 35 cents. You get a lot more for that 35 cents than you do in some papers for 50, but anyway, I think that those things, if they bring people in, that will be great. But I don't really see that they will. What do you think? Well, then, see, you probably read a real newspaper. They don't want you. They already got you. <laughs> but I can't imagine that people who read that will all of a sudden say, oh, I see, I'm hungry for more. I mean, the whole point is it's giving them very little because it thinks that's their attention span. So I don't quite get the, so what exactly is going to make them make the leap? Maybe. Yes. How does the Christian Science Monitor make it uh, with very little advertising? Doesn't have to return net income before taxes of 50%, 40%, 30%. I doubt that it, I, I, you know, I mean, it pays its people, but I doubt, does it even make a profit? I think it's a nonprofit. I mean, you know, this makes a real difference. When I, when I came to the register, the Coles family, and, and th you know, this is problematic, obviously. They weren't pulling a lot of money out, and there were members of the family who thought we could be pulling a lot more money out of this, and we all know what happened then. But you, they were making, I don't know, single digits, and they were happy. And then Gannett comes in, and within a few years, they say, well, 21 million, you know, 23 million. Well, what happens is you cut the staff, you cut the news hall, and you lop off subscribers who aren't of interest to advertisers. And uh, the Christian Science Monitor doesn't have to do that. It, nor does, I mean, I think we're going to have a, more of a mix of some public ownership, some reader-supported, listener-supported, National Public Radio is a good example. It gets very low. You know, I get critics all the time saying, well, you know, it has government support, and it shouldn't, whenever I talk about National Public Radio, which I think it does a great job, I say, well, the government shouldn't support it. Less than 1% of, uh, of National Public Radio revenues come from the government. It wouldn't die if they cut it off completely. It's listener-supported, although increasingly those, what do they call them, sponsorships? Watch out. <laughs> but we'll see. I don't know. Yeah. Right. How does a newspaper or a reporter 
corners deal with the conflict of interest, serious conflict of interest. There are a lot of things that you go and investigate, and I am the newspaper reader, I'm supposed to be interested in that whole reader. But there are a lot of things about you as a person or institution that not I'm interested to learn, but not worth one word from you, especially if it gets to the area of financial interest and where that you don't want to get from. Right. Let me give you an example. Years ago, we had a <coughs> Sunday newspaper strip which is here in Johnny Gosh. Johnny Gosh. Because his name appeared as a milk carton on a television. Still? No, what? Oh, sorry. They were interested to investigate the thing. And they found out some of these people that are in charge of the collecting the money from all these kids that collect the money and are doing this have had sexual re relations with some of the kids. <coughs> Nothing came out as to who the guy was, who the kids were, and where did they end up. Now, as a person that investigated that, what happened to this mess that you didn't say anything about? Well, I have to say, I don't know that that is, I, I was not at the paper when any investigation like that took place. But you're, uh, I think I'm going to have to wrap this up. So what I'm going to do is say that your question is generally about how do we deal with conflicts of interest on the part of reporters and on the part of the newspaper itself. Any reputable medium has a conflict of interest statement. And if you know that it is not abiding by it, I mean, you can ask for the conflict of interest statement. They have codes of ethics. Certainly includes conflict of interest, financial <coughs> interest, uh, you know, public appearances, et cetera, et cetera. If you know that they're not abiding by it, then you ought to call them on it. But reputable newspapers definitely have them. I, we're losing people, and we have time for just one more quick question before uh, the reception. Does that sound right, Pat? Yes, in the back. Interesting. Right. Well, of course, technically speaking, a teen, an 18-year-old is a teen. Um, in most newsrooms, 18 is when man or woman begins. So that particular age would be the one where this would happen. It wouldn't otherwise if they're consistent. But your point is well taken. If we're not consistent and fair, then obviously my my call for fairness uh, is, a, is a weaker one. You all have had wonderful questions, and I appreciate it very much, and I hope I'll have a chance to talk with more of you during the reception. Thank you very much for having us.